So first we will have uh, Manuel Orozco uh, with the Inter-American uh, Dialogue. Uh, he's an expert on remittances in particular, but also on Nicaragua. Uh, he has a B from the National University of Costa Rica uh, and a PhD in political science from UT Austin. He'll be followed by Francisco Monaldi, uh, who uh, has a PhD in political science from Stanford University, yay. Uh, and, um, but he's, he's now at the uh, Rice uh, University's Baker Institute. He's certainly a leading expert in global uh, energy markets and more specifically on uh, the Venezuelan oil industry. And then uh, we will have with us uh, Rick Herrero, uh, who's the executive director of the highly respected Cuba study group, great source of information and ideas about what to do about Cuba. Uh, Rick was born in Puerto Rico, son of Cuban exiles. He has a, a law degree from Cardoso School of Law. Uh, gentlemen, we're very much looking forward to your fresh ideas uh, on what can be done with regard to these three authoritarian regimes in the Caribbean basin. Manuel Orozco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard, and good to be here. Um, I mean, I think it, it is a difficult task and a lot of the problem is that we're dealing with the Cold War mentality in the age of soft power. And that you know, represents a, a difficult way to handle it. One wants violence, the other is trying to prevent it and avoid it. So, Along those lines, I think the, the most important element from, from a policymaking perspective is to improve the alignment and precision as to what are the sources of, I think, of impunity that allow these regimes to remain as deep-rooted dictatorships and not even deep-rooted dictatorships. I think we need to think also of other countries like El Salvador and Honduras. But in any case, the, you have to look at the way in which the rule of law has been subverted the way in which economic populism has been the main source of um, sustained sustenance for the government, as well as to the way in which censorship and misinformation has been applied and the, and the disregard to international agreements. And along those lines, you have a list of a number of options available and sanctions is just one of perhaps 10 more different options. The, the most important effort is to provide greater support to the media, to a free media, but in alternative uh, outlets to you know, enable uh, free radio, YouTube, YouTube radio, for example, to combat misinformation with this information sometimes, but also to provide hacking mechanisms among other things, as well as increasing uh, information about what's going on in these countries. Because one of the major problems, and I see it a lot in Nicaragua, is that people don't know the magnitude of impunity that prevails in their country. They only live the day by day poverty. The, the second approach is to look even, you know, you do have a reality where these states have altered the military balance in the Caribbean basin. Nicaragua alone has invested more uh, money in military purchases than in the past 15 or 20 years than the three Northern Triangle countries combined. So you, you have to, at the very least, perform certain military exercises in order to demonstrate that there is a line that you cannot cross. The third uh, area of, of, of support has to do with international league agreements. The, the um, agreements, including relate, those related to trade. Uh, this goes beyond sanctions. Again, um, you have the violations, for example, of Nicaragua and even certain countries in other uh, parts of Central America that have violated the Central America free trade agreement. Nicaragua has certainly violated the labor side agreement, the environmental side agreement, and different sections of the free trade agreement, particularly the one related to access to uh, financial markets in Nicaragua. And there, there has to be a penalty, a reciprocal, reciprocal approach and response to the extent to which the regime has uh, transgressed the agreement. And this is perhaps the main issue. The proportional response cannot, leave, cannot be provided only through sanctions. And sanctions are there. Uh, as a way to do um, 
you know, a, to make accountable individuals who participate in human rights violations or in money laundering. And this brings up the, the international uh, loan agreements, agreements that countries like Nicaragua have with the Inter-American Development Bank, with the Central American Bank of Economic Integration, for example, have clauses regarding anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, regarding uh, social inclusion that Nicaragua has basically broken and violated. And they have to be held accountable as well as uh, as a result of that, have their financing suspended. None of that has been done. So, so the, the, as you start looking at the different factors that are enabling impunity, and you can see that there are actually different tools available, we're still, uh, we, there is a, a, a significant lack of correspondence between the tools available and the activity. And that has to do, again, because I think policymakers are just numb about the situation. And then you cannot drop the effort of mediation and, and get these co uh, countries to reason among themselves that the transgressions of political authority do have consequences to themselves. And it involves uh, bringing together collective action from different actors, not within, I don't think within the Organization of American States, but you can do it through um, a type of like contadora and support group as it existed in the 1980s, but you know, updated to the 21st century, to this particular moment. And this can be done in different ways, but definitely bringing leadership within the region to make these countries reason and to promote mediated efforts. At the end of the day, um, political transitions depend on negotiated agreements, but you have to change the balance of power. So to change the balance of power, you need to resort to all of these measures. And they include fighting disinformation, military exercises, suspending financial assistance, penalties on trade agreements, and continued sanctions. Th those are at least some of the instruments that you have available to perform an effort in order to change the existing balance of power. And of course, a, a, a fundamental element to all this is to continuously and openly isolate these countries in the diplomatic front and at the same time support the domestic internal opposition in those places, which is pretty much isolated too. So they need to have some visibility and a response from the international community that they are not alone. So those would be my, my initial responses. Uh, thanks, Manuel, that was terrific. Uh, now, um, if um, Francisco Monaldi, has the floor, please, Francisco. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. It's a pleasure to uh, be in this in this panel, and uh, I am. Uh, I hope that I um, I'm able to keep, to give some uh, fresh <laughs> ideas, although some might be a little bit stale. Let, let's hope. Uh, uh, let's hope there are some some interesting uh, um, insights coming in this conversation. So, I, as you mentioned, I, my expertise is mostly on, on, on the energy side, and I think in the case of Venezuela, this is uh, very appropriate because, without a doubt, uh, being an, a country that is uh, uh, totally dependent on oil exports and that actually uh, has a, a strong connection with uh, both Nicaragua and Cuba through that, uh, through that channel, I think uh, this is um, a, a relevant uh, topic to uh, our discussion. So I will uh, very briefly try to assess uh, what has been the, the sanctions, uh, the oil sanctions regime in Venezuela and how could it be changed in order to um, promote better outcomes from the perspective of uh, um, the democracy and, and other objectives now that the US government also has, which are have to do with uh, a, a energy, well, the world energy supply. So, um, Venezuela has had a, a bunch of sanctions, but the ones that have affected the oil industry have mainly been first financial sanctions in 2017 that made it relatively hard for uh, PDVSA to re, uh, restructure its, uh, its debt or refinance its debt that was already at the brink of default before those sanctions. And um, it, it made it also difficult to, uh, you know, uh, basically the, the relationship that they have with some uh, contractors and partners that they were uh, owing money, uh, it made it very hard for those uh, uh, actors to uh, deal with PDVSA given that they couldn't give them credit. And 
Uh, but then in, in 2019, uh, the, the sanctions uh, uh, got uh, significantly uh, uh, more uh, to were toughened up by um, including sanctions as, uh, to the national company as an entity and basically not allowing uh, about 500,000 barrels of oil that used to go from Venezuela uh, to the US and also about 100 and something, so 120,000 barrels of uh, um, diluents and, and products that went from Venezuela to, uh, from sorry, from the US to Venezuela. Diluents um, are basically to um, um, uh, blend with the extra heavy oil of Venezuela. It's uh, either lighter oil or, or, or a refined product that allows uh, that very heavy oil uh, to be more marketable. Um, so um, that was a big blow uh, to Venezuela. Ven uh, the US was the most uh, profitable market uh, for Venezuela. Uh, a lot of the other exports at that time were to basically to China and to India. And in the case of China, a lot of it was to repay Venezuela's debt to China. So uh, a lot of the cash was coming from the US. And so this was a very significant uh, blow. Uh, also, the recognition of Juan Guaidó, which is not uh, ex explicitly a sanction, uh, uh, serves as uh, the purpose of a sanction by making it, uh, by, by basically uh, 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 removing the control over CITGO uh, and uh, other uh, assets outside of uh, Venezuela, but the most important is, is CITGO. And uh, also, you know, in international multilateral agencies like the IMF, um, in Venezuela, even though they, they, these institutions do not recognize Guaido, they do not recognize Maduro either. And so as a result, they cannot uh, um, disperse uh, funds to, um, to Venezuela. And in 2020, with the uh, increase in the uh, maximum pressure policy of the Trump administration, they imposed secondary sanctions. In, in, the, in the year of 2019, uh, Rofnev, the Russian national company, had become the most important uh, a, a marketeer of uh, Venezuelan oil and, and had helped them uh, significantly, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, sanctions. But uh, after that, they were sanctioned. And that not only uh, meant that Russia, uh, despite the, the claims that, that, that they will continue to help Venezuela, stopped completely uh, helping Venezuela in, in the, on the oil side, uh, except I will talk later about the, the banking system. And then, um, uh, it also served as a, as a deterrence to, for other buyers of Venezuelan oil. In particular, India stopped buying uh, Venezuelan oil, and China didn't stop uh, uh, through the dark channels, but the national oil company for China uh, did, did not buy any more Venezuelan oil, which wasn't, uh, you know, in, in the sense of cash flow, that big of a problem because the, the oil going to those companies was... Uh, most of it was uh, to repay the debt. Uh, so, but of course, that means that Venezuela, that you know, the 63, 64 billion dollars that the Chinese uh, over the years loaned Venezuela, there were about 15 billion outstanding by the, at this point, and they have been accumulating uh, about three additional billion of uh, a, a, of interest because they have not been paying uh, because the national companies of China are not buying that oil. Um, so. Um, so production uh, declined dramatically before the U.S. sanctions was about 1.4 million barrels. Then it went down uh, after secondary sanctions and the collapse in the price of oil during the pandemic to as low as 350,000. Uh, today is about a seven to 700 to 750 and 50,000. Most of it goes to China through these uh, dark channels of uh, you know with ghost ships. Uh, transshipment of, of oil. The oil is reported as coming from Malaysia or Singapore or, or Oman or Indonesia in the case of China. So China doesn't report any oil coming uh, actually uh, from Venezuela. So the, the sanctions, of course, uh, that, that, the impact that they had over the oil industry, uh, by the way, it's not only production, it's also the heavy discounts that Venezuela has to give to these intermediaries to get the oil uh, to the independent refiners of China, private, small uh, uh, refiners. And by the way, then the money goes, used to go through Russian banks, uh, which is also something that has, of course, been affected by the Ukrainian, uh, uh, the, by the sanctions to Russia right now. So sanctions uh, had a big impact on the Venezuelan economy. It's hard to distinguish from you know, the, 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 the accumulated bad policies and the problems that the national company already had that was in, you know, in default, that was um, 
uh, production was collapsing even before uh, uh, US sanctions. Um, but uh, no doubt that US sanctions contributed to make it much harder. And by the way, I didn't uh, mention that also the maximum pressure included a, a Chevron, the only a U.S. company remaining uh, operating in, in Venezuela as an operator. There are there were some service companies, and basically they were not allowed to invest anymore and not even get paid uh, uh, their share for, from from PDVSA. So uh, the sanctions did have an, a significant impact on on oil production, and of course that means that they had an impact on the on the economy. And of course, as uh, was mentioned in the previous panel, the collapse of the Venezuelan economy by eighty percent has uh, generated a humanitarian tragedy. And even though it's not caused uh, by sanctions, su sanctions certainly made it uh, uh, harder uh, to, uh, to recover. They had some second order effects that are hard to assess. Like for example, the Maduro administration became much more willing to uh, dollarize, for example, or allow uh, 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 pr the price mechanism to work because they, they, the, the sanctions made them you know, in, in, absolutely inviable, their, their, their policies that were causing hyperinflation, et cetera. So, so maybe you know, we had to consider that, but you know, the, the bottom line is that the revenues, oil revenues fell down. They, the effects in terms of political change were not uh, um, by any uh, uh, means, I mean, uh, Venezuela has become more consolidated as an authoritarian uh, regime. And so, um, so in that sense, the policy of, of course was a, a tremendous failure. You might, might argue that, that because uh, of, of the, the sort of pressure of additional sanctions, et cetera, maybe uh, Maduro uh, you know, went, went, didn't go as uh, uh, far uh, as say imprisoning Juan Guaido or doing other uh, uh, violations of human rights. Um, but but um, in terms of any meaningful uh, political change, I mean, the only thing that, that, that at some point was obtained was some members in the Electoral Council and, and you know, the, the fact that the recent elections uh, to uh, regional elections in Venezuela uh, had some participation of the opposition and, and some significant, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a few states, very few, but, but some... Uh, major races were won, won by the by the opposition so um having said that the, the biden administration came in thinking that that this regime was not working and there had to be some reviews but of course we all know that it it, it got untangled i mean tangled with other the many other priorities that the administration had plus the florida politics that makes uh, touching this issue uh, very uh, uh, difficult and we can talk about that later but uh, however, Ukraine happened, and and so even though there were um, uh, uh, some uh, things being discussed in the past in terms of sanctions, uh, changes in the sanctions regime, basically two things were being discussed. One was to uh, get Western companies to uh, be allowed to to take some cargos to get paid, and the the the, the reason why that is not just a, a matter of these private companies that shouldn't uh, be an issue for the U.S. government is that. If those companies leave, not only strategically might be uh, bad for uh, from the Western perspective, but it also means that, for example, the ENI and Repsol uh, uh, operate the, the largest uh, oil, uh, uh, sorry, gas field that, that supplies domestically Venezuela, and that will have uh, additional impacts of over electricity. Uh, uh, in the case of Chevron, um, you know, if Chevron leaves, that will uh, mean a Further the, the destruction of the Venezuelan oil industry already. Total and Equinor uh, uh, left, uh, which were some of the biggest uh, partners. So, uh, so that was being under consideration. And then humanitarian ideas of uh, changing oil for humanitarian relief. The 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 key here is that the current way in which the flows of oil and money work out is much more opaque than ever. And so, if if you uh, uh, are worried about uh, the Maduro administration being, uh, you know, benefiting from a, a, any money if the oil flows back to the U.S. or to Europe. Uh, well, the, the, the comparison should be with what is happening now. And what is happening now is that, you know, those dark channels with heavy discounts that are basically destroying value for Venezuela, and then the money is going in, in a very opaque way in the pockets of, of uh, of, of the governing elite, et cetera. So 
it's a terrible uh, um, a, a sort of uh, state of affairs uh, compared to even what we had in the past when you know Western companies were involved in those in those flows. But on top of that, the, the proposals being considered were basically geared towards the idea that the payments that say Chevron or ENI or Sol will make will go to accounts uh, uh, from, from the oil, uh, sorry, that was sold outside. Part will, will be to offset debt, to pay debt, but the other one will go to accounts that will fund programs like the United Nations Food Program or other uh, uh, programs of that, uh, of that nature. So that was on the table when the Ukraine invasion happened. And of course, everybody knows that Juan Gonzalez uh, uh, according to the Financial Times in Justin Bieber's uh, plane, don't, don't ask me why, <laughs> went to Venezuela. And, uh, and that opened up a new scenario. It's clear now that the United States has uh, an interest in getting other sources of supply of oil uh, outside of you know, the Middle East and, and, and Russia. And, uh, and, and Venezuela, besides Guyana and, and Brazil, is the only country uh, uh, in the region, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, of course, outside of the US itself and Canada, that can uh, increase significantly supply if a set of conditions happen that, that in which sanctions is a necessary but not sufficient, uh, sanction, some sanctions relief necessary but not sufficient uh, condition. So in the short term, it's not that relevant. You know, a lot of the rhetoric has been about, oh, Venezuelan oil can serve to supply the Russian oil that is not coming uh, to the US because it was banned. That, that's not the key issue because uh, the, 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 the price of gasoline in the US is, is set in, uh, uh, by the uh, world uh, uh, price of oil and um, Venezuela will not be able to add a significant amount of barrels in one year, uh, maybe 150,000 that, that, that Chevron can add. Uh, but so that means that in the short term, besides helping some refiners in the Gulf Coast of Texas, it's little what Venezuelan oil can do. However, the opportunity brought by this might uh, uh, make the United States uh, willing to give that license to, to Chevron right now because of, I think, not only potentially some benefits in the very short run, but also in the longer run, Venezuela if the conditions are met in terms of uh, the liberalization of the oil industry, it can increase uh, oil production, but it will take a, a significant amount of private investment and it will take time. Uh, uh, some consultancies and my uh, own estimates uh, uh, you know, are that it, it could increase production to say 1.3, 1.4 million barrels in, in about uh, uh, five years. And, and, and maybe by the end of the decade, uh, if everything aligned, you know, two million uh, additional uh, barrels of oil, which is a significant amount for the for the global uh, uh, market. So, so the longer term, if you believe that the geopolitics of the world has changed, that this is the uh, 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 Cold War 2.0, then uh, you might think uh, this is in the interest of not only the United States but even Europe. Even some natural gas can be exported to Europe, uh, and of course. It's part now of the geopolitics of trying to get Venezuela out of the sphere of influence of, uh, of Russia to some, to some extent. Uh, of course, that to some extent aligns and to some extent doesn't with the agenda that the US government has in terms of democratization of Venezuela. Because the only thing making Maduro uh, uh, to be willing to go to the negotiation table in Mexico is without the app discussing sanctions relief. And, and, and the reasons why Maduro might even care more about that, because in January, Maduro was benefiting for a very significant increase in the price of oil. The um, uh, oil exports are going to be between two and three times uh, in terms of, uh, of revenues. Oil revenues will be two and three times what they were last year. So Maduro is benefiting from an oil windfall, uh, and not as big, of course, as, as he had in, the, in, the, in years past, because production is much lower and prices are, are, are pretty high, but not maybe as high as the peak of, of, 20, of 2012. So, uh, so the bottom line is that uh, Maduro has some interest also because today he has these very heavy discounts when he sells all to, all to China because his mechanism to evade sanctions uh, through Russian banks is disrupted. And because very importantly, Russia is trying to sell oil to the same refiners at a very heavy discount because they, they, the oil that they used to send to the US and part to Europe, and they are now trying to sell in, in, in China and, and in India. And so, uh, and so Venezuela is having a little bit of a difficulty selling their oil and having to give even bigger discounts. So the incentives 
uh, seem to be aligned between both the US and Venezuela in terms of uh, getting some things done with some degree of sanctions relief. And I think that that is a, a that it will be great if that keeps uh, brings back the the negotiation uh, the negotiations in 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 Mexico as it seems it it will. So we might hear some news uh, in the in the next few weeks because the uh, uh, license to Chevron uh, expires on June first, and they have to either either renew the same uh, license or uh, do something about it. And so maybe something happens before uh, June first. If it doesn't. Who knows uh, if it will happen before the uh, uh, before the midterm uh, elections? That will change a little bit. There. And so, to to close, uh, I think there are some interesting opportunities to bring Maduro uh, that has been totally unwilling to give almost any any uh, any uh, important reform in terms of democratization or reinstitutionalization of the country. This, if it's done smartly and in a in a way that it's clear about how things could be triggered in terms of positive results for Maduro, but also uh, a snap back in case he doesn't follow through. It might be, uh, I don't think this will lead to regime change, but it might lead to some uh, out intermediate outcomes that might be uh, a, a attainable. This has, and this is my final comment, a, a potential significant uh, importance if it's linked also to negotiations with uh, uh, Cuba and potentially Nicaragua, because with these high oil prices, uh, uh, Cuba um, it relies tremendously on Venezuela for their oil. Venezuela has reduced uh, uh, significantly with the peak times, although it has increased recently because whatever they cannot sell in China, they, they try to sell in Cuba instead of closing production. Uh, well, selling Cuba is sent to Cuba because Cuba uh, doesn't pay Venezuela. Uh, I mean, it pays in, uh, sometimes in time. And of course, the, the some assistant in intelligence, et cetera, is absolutely essential for the regime. Uh, so, but bottom line, these things tend to be tied. If you look at how, when, when did Nicaragua become much more aut authoritarian and when Venezuela became much more authoritarian, partly was when the flows of Venezuelan uh, revenues dried out in both countries. Uh, and basically uh, that meant that this, the, the president that Ortega and, and Maduro were less popular and they uh, had much more difficulty winning elections. And so they became much more authoritarian. And with that, um, I, I finish. We can, we can discuss later other issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Francisco, that, that was really terrific. And I love the, uh, sort of the, the fresh ideas on the table. We have to turn to, to Rick Herrero, but I, I, just, I, I have to ask you a, a quick follow-up question, if you don't mind. Sure. So you laid out this sort of uh, post-Ukrainian uh, possibility of some sort of uh, uh, deal for sanctions relief uh, you know, for uh, increased oil production, which would be useful for the international markets as well as the US. Uh, and even though the results aren't immediate, uh, Biden's got two big problems now, both related to Latin America and the global situation. One is inflation, driven in large part by energy prices uh, and supply chain issues. And then two, something we haven't talked that much about, but it's related, the problems at the border and the pressures from immigration. And yes. those are two huge liabilities facing the administration, uh, which we need to pursue a little bit more in this panel. But you, you suggested uh, linking uh, sanctions relief to uh, some sort of domestic political dialogue. Uh, uh, could you spell out a little bit, I know it's complicated, but a little bit what, what, what the content uh, of that might be? And then on the other piece, what would be the domestic political coalition in the United States uh, that would be willing to support uh, such a forward movement? Yes, well, it seems at this point that within the Biden administration, these sort of two strands, the ones who cares about um, uh, the energy supply in the world and the one that wants to move things in Venezuela, seem to have a line uh, and that feeling that the cost, potential cost in Florida now are, you know, compensated, I mean, political cost uh, compensated by, by this opportunity. We don't know exactly what Juan Gonzalez, uh, 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 you know, negotiated with Maduro in that meeting, but it it seems clear that in order to get Maduro uh, back to the table in Mexico, uh, they are waiting for some first step from the from the United States regarding potentially Chevron's uh, license. And of course, the, I think the the key negotiation here is that Maduro 
uh, is not very happy with the idea that all the cash flow will be e either go to pay Chevron or to go to a humanitarian program that he doesn't control and cannot get, get credit for. So I think uh, he, he felt uh, with the visit of, of, uh, of Juan Gonzalez that he had a little bit much more leverage. And so I think he's disappointed that the reaction by Senator Menendez and in Congress and elsewhere Ha, 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 do, 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 has not allowed uh, for some uh, uh, movement here. But I think uh, uh, this had to be uh, a set of steps uh, that, that had to be uh, progressive and, and, and I think very well crafted because as, uh, was, as you mentioned before with Cuba, I imagine that when, when, Ma when Maduro took, talks to, uh, to the Cubans, which are very close to him, I mean, this is a guy that was formed there in many ways, and they, they, they will tell him, well, you, don't, you cannot trust the United States. There are going to be midterms and the Republicans will take uh, over Congress. And, you know, it, it, maybe a lot of these promises are not going to happen. So I think the, this has to be a very calibrated step-by-step, uh, step, uh, you know, uh, in which uh, things have to be conditioned and worked out in a way that, uh, that, that are uh, progressive and, and that can be a, a, a snap back. The problem, as you point and to close, is exactly what you point out. It's is what about the U.S. right? Because he, he, Maduro has some issues in his coalition in moving too fast to to relate to, to the U.S. Uh, um, but uh, the problems are, are more on this side because, from the perspective of of the U.S., uh, without a doubt, uh, it, it, it will be uh, complex when the Republicans, if the Republicans control. Um, the, the two houses, uh, I mean, even though they will be unlikely to be able, for example, to pass a Verdad Act 2.0 that, that eliminates this possibility, uh, uh, but they clearly can, can, you know, can, can affect a lot of these uh, potential policy options. Yeah, uh, the problem, uh, among the problems in US foreign policy these days is the perception, not only in Latin America, but worldwide, of the questionable reliability and credibility of the United States. Uh, from uh, Obama to Biden, uh, to Trump, to Biden. This, this is a whipsaw that has mm -hmm. everybody confused. And then uh, it, uh, because the margins of majority are so narrow uh, in the US Senate, uh, every Senator thinks that they can be the Secretary of State. <laughs> yes. And uh, if you're looking from Caracas, you're saying, who's the Secretary of State? Is it Robert Menendez or Tony Blinken? I'm not sure. <laughs> right? So yeah. uh, I think we can understand why there might be some confusion, hesitancy, and ultimately lack of trust um, on the other side of the bargaining table. So thanks. We'll come back to all these issues. Okay. And now Rick Herrero is going to uh, give us some insights into the Cuban situation that I know he's been following forever, uh, knows all the details, and will come up with some fresh ideas, some of which may be a reversion to the Obama policies. Uh, he'll give us some assessment of those. Uh, but now that's uh, five, six years ago. Uh, where are we and how can we move forward? Rick, thanks so much for being with us. Take Richard, it away. Richard, thank you. And thanks uh, the Institute of Americas for inviting me today. Um, I think there are two primary obstacles to the US taking a fresh approach towards Cuba. Um, number one is the clear lack of consensus over what our policy should be towards Cuba. There are two competing theories of change that have defined U.S.-Cuba policy um, over, over recent years uh, that are very much at odds with each other. One is punishing the regime, tightening the screws ever, ever, ever so tighter, even if innocent Cubans on the ground end up as collateral damage. This is the thinking behind uh, much of the embargo, the laws that codified embargo sanctions, such as the Cuban Democracy Act, the House Burton Act, both passed in the 1990s, uh, and as, as well as the, the uh, we saw a reversion to this, th this theory during the Trump years, uh, after the opening uh, that we saw during the Obama years, which was very much uh, uh, animated by a, the other theory of change, which is empowering the Cuban people even if this produces a collateral benefit to the regime, right? Expanding the flow of resources, contacts, information, cat uh, uh, capital from the United States, United, particularly the United States private sector, civil society, Cuban American community to Cubans on the ground, right? So that they have greater access to, to, to resources and to information uh, 
uh, they can improve their own standard of living and be in a better position to drive change from within. It came from a recognition that this idea that informs the previous theory of change, that you can somehow have a bunch of technocratic elites in Washington trying to micromanage a political uh, transition or a democratic transition in Cuba uh, has, doesn't work, uh, probably will never work, uh, and causes a lot of harm to innocent people on the ground, while the folks that are actually running the show in Cuba uh, pretty much remain unharmed and continue doing whatever they want to do. Um, so that's number one, that lack of consensus between those two theories of change. Number two is that, that one of those is politically popular uh, and clearly so, has clear political advantages in so far uh, in, in electoral terms in Florida, in the Senate, in so far as not stoking the ire of certain members of the Senate, such as Senator Bob Menendez, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Rick Scott, folks who will fall on their sword and, uh, over Cuba policy, really be a thorn on the side of any uh, uh, administration that doesn't toe their line on this policy. And even though you, the, the other theory of change, the, one, uh, the theory of change that it's much more focused on engagement and empowering the Cuban people has a lot of champions in Congress, they are not willing to go as far as some of these uh, supporters of embargo policy are. Um, and so you have one policy approach, again, the, the more hardline one that it's politically popular, the other one doesn't really have much of a political base to support it. Um, so what you're seeing right now is a lack of political will on the part of this White House to pursue what we understand is their preferred course if politics wouldn't be an issue, right, which is to return to a policy along the lines of the Obama approach, if not the same approach exactly. See, unlike the other two countries that we're discussing in this session, our policy towards Cuba is almost entirely defined by domestic political concerns. This is because Cuba uh, is of no significant geopolitical interest to the United States, much less a vital one. It has no oil, there's no significant trade, no serious security concerns beyond immigration. So really the primary calculus uh, over whether to move or not on Cuba becomes is there a political upside or what's the downside and how does it benefit me domestically, not so much as advancing United States interests in the region, much less in on the island. So we saw this under Trump. Trump at first supported the Obama opening towards Cuba. He said it during the debates that it was time to open up to Cuba. He would have gotten a better deal, but it was time. But then he did a 180 on that when he was trying to win Florida in 2016 and then embraced a hardline policy where we saw the maximum pressure policy uh, that uh, was enforced throughout the course of his, well, starting really in 2019, though we saw a moderate reversal of, of the Obama policy prior to then. Um, but we really saw that kick into high gear with maximum pressure policy in 2019. And it was, and it was in ways worked into that electoral strategy uh, to keep that winning coalition locked down, excited, and uh, ready to vote, vote uh, uh, Trump into a second term in 2020. Under Biden, um, it's not clear how they're looking at, at, uh, at Florida. It doesn't seem, it, it, there, there seem to be certain voices within the political team who are concerned about how this could impact them in Florida. At the same time, you haven't seen any clear overtures by the Biden administration to Florida. You haven't seen any significant investments by the Democratic Party or the DCCC um, or any uh, partisan Democratic uh, uh, operation to try to uh, build significant electoral infrastructure uh, in Florida to be competitive in the 2022 election or, or in the 2024 election. Uh, by some accounts, it looks like Florida is now a red state and it's uh, increasingly hard for Democrats to actually make inroads in that state or, or win statewide anymore. Um, so it's not so even if there is opposition because of Florida concerns, it doesn't seem to be the override over overriding reason for them for their inaction. Uh, a much greater concern has been uh, their relationship with Senator Bob Menendez and the uh, and, and a fear of Menendez, if you will, because you have a lot of people in that administration that worked in the Senate. They know uh, 
how uh, Senator Menendez, his views on this policy, uh, they don't want to uh, sort of poke the bear on this. So they preemptively don't touch the issue, announced there wouldn't be a priority very early in the administration because they wanted to keep him happy. And as part of that 50 senator uh, uh, coalition that they need in order to get their legislative agenda through. So what you have right now um, in, under the Biden administration is uh, basically broken or delayed promises. You, they, he ran on reopening travel, reopening remittances, uh, reopening the embassy. That's the one area where we've seen some movement, primarily because they're very concerned about the, mig the, the migration crisis. You are seeing now, um, uh, we are quickly approaching Mariel Boatlift numbers in terms of numbers of Cubans that are arriving at U.S. border. Uh, that Mariel in, in, in 1980 reached 125,000 within the course of just under six months. Uh, we are now, in the last two months, we saw 32,000 arrive at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border. 30, uh, in March, 35,000 arrive in April. Uh, so we're well on our way to beat those numbers, uh, the numbers from the Mariel boat lift. Um, so we're only seeing movement in so far as restaffing the embassy in very, they're taking very uh, baby steps to do so. It's taking a long time to restaff that embassy. Um, they're slowly reopening consular services. Instead, what you've seen is several rounds of targeted sanctions in response to violent crackdowns and, and the subsequent sentencing of July 11th uh, and uh, November 15th protesters. Um, you're, you, um, again, you're seeing uh, the, uh, the issuing of immigrant visas, but none, no non-immigrant visas. But otherwise, it's basically Trump, Trump policy on cruise control. Um, all the sanctions remain in place that Trump, uh, that Trump put in place. There's been some talk of trying to identify a third way approach towards Cuba, but they've never off this administration has never offered any specifics on that. Um, and right now it's really hard to see them taking any proactive steps towards rapprochement without uh, seeing a significant prisoner release from the hundreds that were uh, sentenced uh, to exorbitant uh, uh, sentence uh, or, or were slapped with exorbitant sentences in the in the wake of the uh, of the protests of uh, 2021. So right now, what we're seeing is that under current policy, by all measures, uh, Cuba and Cubans on the ground are worse off today than they were in January 2019 when uh, the Trump administration started enforcing its maximum pressure uh, policy. This, uh, this, this policy has been real, a real stress test for the Cuban government. And what we've seen is that it's that's, that system, despite having the stress of sanctions, uh, their own economic mismanagement, the global pandemic for, uh, for which they had to shut down their economy, they've proven resilient in the face of all this. Um, part of it has been by increasing repression significantly against any voices of dissent on the island. Um, but you're seeing Cuba's ruling uh, elites and institutions um, that had for decades been steered by one maximum leader um, and which you can otherwise see suffering from uh, fissures within that larger system. You're now, there's no clear leadership or vision that brings them together. Um, it seems to be much more a mutual fear of change and a shared resistance to U.S. sanctions than any sort of concept as to where the country should go in a post-Fidel and Raul era. Um, you're, seeing, um, you're seeing, as I mentioned before, uh, as part of, this, uh, of, of, of the situation on the ground, and particularly the increased repression, you're seeing scores of Cuban activists, many of those that protested in, these, uh, in July 11th, uh, being forced into exile. Tens of thousands more coming uh, to the United States uh, through irregular means uh, on a monthly basis. Um, you're also seeing that this policy has been completely incapable of isolating Cuba in any significant way. Uh, even though after, in the wake of July 11th, there were calls by the United States to try to rally some of our allies in Europe and in Latin America to, uh, to uh, basically put more pressure on the Cuban uh, regime. Um, we, we didn't see any of those 
other countries impose sanctions on them. There was some talks, uh, some calls in the European Parliament for Magnitsky sanctions against the Cuban government, but none were ever imposed by the EU. Uh, and all the while, Cuba's ties with Maduro uh, remain intact. If anything, they just announced uh, this week that they are going to strengthen their ties even more. And you're also seeing security cooperation with Cuba at a at its peak, at, you know, at a new peak ever since the fall. I mean, with Cuba, forgive me. Uh, security cooperation with Russia at a peak that we haven't seen since the fall of Soviet Union. Um, by no means is the is Russia able to be the the benefactor of the Cuban economy the way it was during uh, the Cold War. But you are seeing increased security cooperation. Uh, you are seeing uh, them uh, sending. Uh, humanitarian aid to Cuba and, and in terms of most recently grain shipments to, to, to the island. And uh, Cuba has been, even though it abstained from voting to condemn uh, Russia, Russia does remain its top political ally uh, sort of in, 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 the, global, uh, in, in the global sphere. Uh, at the same time, you're seeing China, uh, which is already Cuba's largest trading partner since 2017, uh, in January or in late December, signed an agreement uh, with uh, the Diaz Canal government to incorporate Cuba into its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So, at this entire maximum pressure policy has been counterproductive. It has not resulted in any any positive outcomes or anything that you can that can be interpreted as a better outcome for the Cuban people or for U.S. interests in the region. Um, as far as a better approach, what should we should be uh, doing right now? Uh, should the, we see the political will coming from the White House? Uh, I would say uh, restore those policies meant to support the Cuban people, uh, prioritize those again. So re reverse a lot of those sanctions that were put in place by Trump that have a disproportionate impact on the Cuban people, uh, you know, re lifting restrictions on commercial and charter flight, ending caps on remittances or reopening channels for remittances, uh, helping to alleviate root causes of migration by restoring full consular services in Cuba, restoring the Cuban Family Reunification Program, five-year multiple entry visas for Cuban nationals, uh, as well as revising banking and financial uh, and finance regulations to ensure continuity of, of, of those formal uh, remittance uh, channels that I mentioned and correspondent banking in Cuba. Um, we should also uh, return to supporting to 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 establishing the support for the Cuban private sector as a policy priority, especially now that Cuba, in the wake of July 11th, finally legalized the, the creation of small and medium sized enterprises uh, through the equivalent of what of what would be the U.S. equivalent of an LLC in Cuba. Um, so those LLCs cannot accept foreign members as part of the LLCs, but the Cuban law is silent as to whether they can accept financing. So it's being interpreted on the ground by many as an opportunity for them to accept foreign financing. At the same time, our regulations, regulations that remain, that were put in place under Obama uh, to support the private sector and were left untouched by Trump and by Biden also are silent on financing. So that's an interesting area to explore. There, there could be, you could really open up a lot of support uh, for, for that private sector at this moment. Uh, but basically taking, the, you know, reversing a lot of those sanctions that have a disproportionate impact on the people and don't really put any real pressure on the rulers. Uh, number two is diplomatic engagement. You got to tackle the tough stuff with, uh, with the Cuban government through direct high level diplomatic talks, right? Uh, the same way that we saw them sit down and start having high level diplomatic talks a couple of weeks ago to address the migratory issue, we should be having talks on a, on a broad uh, spectrum of longstanding uh, uh, points of contention between the United States and Cuba. This could include, you know, within that agenda, you can put in, you can include the settlement of longstanding certified uh, US property claims, defining a pathway for resolving Cuban American property claims, structuring private sector trade and investment uh, to keep them compliant with uh, US, US sanctions, um, addressing the issue in Venezuela, particularly involving Cuba in any uh, multinational negotiations uh, with, the, with the Maduro regime, um, you know, particularly if it's in part to broker elections in Venezuela as well as returning U.S. fugitives uh, to the United States uh, that are currently uh, 
being uh, uh, that are that are currently in Cuba. These are issues that have been longstanding points of contention between Cuba and and uh, and the United States that don't directly uh, go to the heart of Cuban sovereignty, uh, but that could help build political capital to improve relations, go further, show some wins, and build back support for a policy of engagement. Because right now, the po because there has been so little political engagement on the ground, what you have is sort of a li the lingering attitudes and the lingering narratives that were put in place during the Obama years. I mean, I'm sorry, during the Trump years. And no, there has been no real effort to reset the narrative by this uh, Biden administration. Instead, you're just seeing more of the same. Uh, Rick, that, that was really uh, terrific, both in terms of your analysis of uh, past policies and, and possible ways forward. Uh, before we open it up to the, the full panel, let me just ask you uh, two quick, well, a comment and a question. Sure. Uh, I, I think the administration uh, seemed to have been behaved that, well, uh, I, we could ignore Cuba or stick with current policies, and that's sort of a freebie because uh, Cuba is very weak, it has no influence, et cetera. Uh, and so it's all about domestic politics. And I don't have to worry about the international uh, implications. But we're seeing recently, actually, in two specific areas, that, that assumption was incorrect. Uh, one, the migration crisis, uh, which is you know, uh, among the top two or three problems facing this administration politically in the United States. And as you pointed out, what over 100,000 Cubans knocking at the, at the gates of the US, huge problem now, and the numbers are increasing. Uh, and the, the other issue we're seeing around the Summit of the Americas, that um, you know, suddenly uh, the major diplomatic initiative of the Biden administration in the Western Hemisphere seems at risk over the Cuba issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, Which I was would, entirely foreseeable, right? Uh, look, because I would, I would love to see the internal memorandum that were sent uh, to the president and the national security advisor, whether they warned them about this or whether they downplayed the possible risk. But yes, uh, it should have been foreseeable. So, um, so there, there are some international repercussions to a, to a foreign policy based solely on domestic politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that, but that, that, that brings me to my question to you about the politics of Florida. Uh, the way I read it, I think along the lines of what you said, uh, the Republicans won Florida in the last presidential election by 400,000 votes. Uh, therefore, if, even if every Cuban American uh, switch to the Democrats, they would still fall way short. And the trends in Florida seem to be, as you suggested, in the opposite direction. So the idea of, of flipping Florida in the electoral college seems beyond reach. Okay, so that then brings the politics to uh, a couple of uh, districts in South Florida. Uh, perhaps you could uh, update us on, do the Democrats really have um, a, a reasonable aspiration of taking back uh, two or three seats. But linked to that, uh, we will recall that the opening under Obama in 2014 occurred only after, ironically, the Democrats lost control of the Senate and Bob Menendez lost his, his power as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So looking to the post elections, if as people seem to be predicting, we don't know, of course, if the Republicans do get control of the Senate, Menendez is dethroned, uh, would that ironically give the administration a little more running room on Cuba? Yeah, I mean, um, so there's a lot there uh, to respond to. One is it's, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the session, the frustration that so many are, are expressing in terms of how this uh, administration is, um, is handling much of its foreign policy towards the region. It seemed like there was, uh, you know, this administration decided early on to park any issue that didn't have clear political advantages for them domestically, and instead tackle the ones that they perceived did. Um, and so Cuba didn't have any po uh, clear political upside. Uh, Venezuela didn't have any clear political upside. It seemed China did, Afghanistan did. You saw them focus like a laser on those two. Russia didn't at the time. Um, but the thing about trying to park the rest of the world is that the rest of the world gets to have a say <laughs> and, and, and can sneak up on you fast. And that's exactly what's happened. You, you're, uh, you know, we don't even need to get into what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, but nobody was expecting that a year ago. Um, but on Cuba, the, we understood that by parking this issue, it was only going to aggravate conditions on the ground. It was going to risk 
uh, in, uh, in, uh, making the migratory situation even worse. Um, we had been warning the administration from last year that they could be facing numbers close to a Mariel within a year. They are now there. Um, they themselves, when it comes to the uh, Summit of the Americas, many of the folks in this, in this White House served under Obama. They had the experience of those summits of the Americas. They know how Cuba is in many ways sort of a, a key, the key to a successful summit. And they should have anticipated that by not inviting neighbors, that was going to spark uh, uh, a backlash. My, it, my sense is that this, the, the political team must have been warned and they must have arrived at the conclusion that the domestic, domestic political concerns were more important than whatever egg on their face they got from uh, not inviting these neighbors and having potential boycotts or, or sort of the, the pushback that they're getting from the rest of the region, which is sort of just adds insult, insult to injury in many ways. When it comes to Florida and, and larger political concerns, this, you know, to, as far as Cuba's concerned, it would be good to see this administration uh, sort of uh, decide how it, what it wants to do. Right, because if you are going to, if you're going to decide to play in Florida, it would be good to see this administration and the Democratic Party make a play for Florida. Try to be competitive. It's yes, it got even harder now, but you're not seeing any effort whatsoever on their on their part to really be competitive. There's no, there's you know you don't you don't see the resources being invested into winning elections in Florida that you saw Democrats make. Under, under Obama in 2008, under Obama in 12, uh, even in 2016 under Hillary, even though it, in, in her effort was didn't match those of Obama during in those previous elections. So if you're going to basically, and, and also, you know, the unwritten truth here um, is that Florida was never part of the, the core electoral strategy in 2020. This administration, uh, the, the campaign uh, was seeking to win the election in the Midwest. And that's exactly where it won the election was Georgia. Um, it, Florida wasn't really uh, a do or die state. It wasn't part of that calculus. So, so they weren't all in. For Trump, it was. That's why Trump was all in. That's why the Trump was there constantly or, he, or his top lieutenants uh, were down there on a weekly uh, or monthly basis, holding interviews, uh, uh, organizing rallies and whatnot. Um, um, and so, and also why you saw a drip, drip of sanctions, right? You could have, you could have, you, they could have rolled out those sanctions in packages. They, they could have been, you know, quarterly. They could have been monthly. Instead, they were weekly. Every week they were announcing a new sanction because it, because it was, it was a, it was politically driven. They wanted to keep it fresh on the headlines that they were constantly tightening the screws on the Cuban regime. Um, you're not seeing any, like any sort of proportionate level of investment or interest by Democrats in, in, in Florida. So if you're going to leave Florida alone, you're not going to play, then at least do what you know it's right towards Cuba. This White House, the folks in this White House understand that the current policy is a dead end street. It doesn't, it doesn't achieve anything for the Cuban people, for U.S. interests. It's just a thorn on their side, but it's a minor one, and they're willing to put up with it because they have other interests that, uh, that supersede Cuba, particularly now and through the midterm, keeping Menendez happy and keeping that coalition, keeping sort of the, the Democrats <laughs> united in the Senate so they can pass whatever element of their legislative agenda they get through. But after that, after the midterms, assuming that Republicans take back the Senate, which is very likely, go back to a policy that you believe is right, that you think is gonna yield results. Um, but they need to make that decision. They can't, they, they can't continue to dither on Florida, especially if you're not making up, you know, it's like it, it, time's running out, like elections keep coming. The cycles don't stop until you make up your mind. But in the meantime, you're just keeping policies in place that are causing a, a, an extreme uh, degree of damage, uh, are very disruptive to the Cuban people, and are not doing anything towards our adversaries on the island. They're not hurting the rulers. They're just pushing them uh, further into the hands of people that we would like to balance uh, 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 those relationships with instead of having them fully aligned, such as China, Russia, 
Venezuela, and so on. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, so maybe after the midterms, uh, if Menendez is dethroned, uh, we'll see a review of, uh, of the uh, Washington DC politics of Cuba policy. Uh, let me go back now to uh, uh, Nicaragua, if I could, uh, Manuel. Uh, you raised so many interesting, uh, interesting ideas. Uh, on the one hand, you have you suggest uh, various forms of uh, increased sanctions, um, but my question for you is really how much leverage is there? Uh, last time I looked at the numbers, uh, the government of Nicaragua, for all its faults, uh, has maintained a rather cautious fiscal and monetary policy. The central bank and the Treasury Department remain uh, professional and expert. Uh, as a result, the regime has accumulated uh, some $4 billion in net, I think $6 billion in gross international reserves, which gives them something like six months of import coverage, which is a very prudent uh, ratio. Uh, it does not, it suggests that even if you could, you know, stem the flow from the MDBs by a couple hundred million a year or whatever, uh, that, uh, that would be at the margin, that that would not fundamentally shake uh, the, the finances of, of, the, of the regime. So that's sort of one question. But the other is, uh, you advocated mediation. Uh, here's, here's the big issue that I see. Can you have talks with Ortega Murillo? These are folks who have over so many years demonstrated their ability to coax, pretend, delay, renege, uh, they'll sign a paper today and ignore it tomorrow. Uh, so uh, what would be the basis for that minimal degree of trust that you would need uh, between, an op between opposition, which itself is so weak and fragmented due to repression, uh, and uh, Ortega Murillo, who have demonstrated now uh, in 2018 that they are perfectly prepared to push aside any pretense of democracy and just use brutal force. So how can we negotiate? How can we have a mediation with such uh, government? Thanks. I think uh, those are very good questions. And uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just um, highlight something that Ricardo mentioned with regards to you know, the administration. I think there is unfortunately um, two realities that happened. One was an obsession with the Northern Triangle that set aside all other foreign policy issues, not just within Latin America, but internationally. And then that obsession was shattered not only by the reality of the unexpected flow of migration on the one hand, but also by the fact that they couldn't handle uh, a, an appropriate response with the countries they had at hand. So, so that, that left them basically with a stoic, a stoic response to policy. No matter what we do, it's not going to work. And that perspective has translated to all other countries. Um, you know, I, I was involved in the, in the discussions over remittances to Cuba, for example, and it was just mind boggling to see that they didn't know what to do. You know, treasury has us all our hands tied. There is nothing we can do because everything has to go through uh, in CMEX. So uh, the same thing has happened with Nicaragua. Not only there was a conscious decision not to include Nicaragua into any policy approach uh, until you resolve the Northern Triangle problem, which you know we know it was impossible to. To solve Resol within. We're going to resolve it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have answers and solutions, but they don't even want to look into, you know, they, uh, anyway. And then, uh, and then was Venezuela, which was almost like set aside. Uh, we don't want, no queremos trabajar con Venezuela, aún no. So, um, and so that, that makes it very difficult to have really uh, any type of solution to be implemented because there is a stoicism in the foreign policy making and that's self-destructive. Um, and on top of that, you do have, I think you point out the, the finances of the regime. I, I think the regime has prepared itself with two years leverage. Um, and the, my approach is that you have to combine and I hate to use the, the, the cliche phrases of carrot and stick, but you do have economic pressure and economic diplomacy 
that have to work hand in hand. And on the economic side, um, I think, yes, there is a macroeconomic uh, pretense of stability, but in the inside, in the, in the, in the interior among society, the economic conditions are really dire. People are not doing well. They are not uh, making ends meet. And of course, yes, this helps dictatorships. We know we see Cuba as a good example. The worse the economy is, the better the system it uh, remains in power. And it, it is happening in Nicaragua. So the only way is to provide signaling that you can have a, an economic uh, recovery program. And that brings up the second part, the political side. Can you approach Ortega Murillo? You can approach Ortega, you cannot approach Rosario. But despite that, I think the, the family uh, looks up to Central America and Mexico. And I think this is the entry point. We need to bring the Central American countries like you did in the 1980s to have a regional approach because Ortega measured himself with regards to the rest of the Central American countries. He doesn't care about South America or the Caribbean or even the United States, uh, short of military intervention. But it does care what Giamate thinks, what Juan Orlando thinks, and now, you know, Celaya, because it's not Castro who is in charge in Honduras. And, and so we need to work with them in order to bring up some sort of reasoning, you know, let's work out with an economic diplomatic approach a solution to the Nicaraguan political crisis. And this is where the negotiator, I think the spectrum of negotiation will come up more clearly, but you need to have those two approaches, the Central American leadership on the one hand, and on the other hand, you need to have uh, an economic diplomacy component and that involves the Gran Capital. I think the, the private sector plays an important role. It has, uh, avoided dealing with this issue, even though you cannot disregard the fact that there is extortion going on. Um, the business sector is really on a big uh, crisis. I mean, lending in the private sector has dropped uh, one and a half billion. You, you, know, you mentioned that international reserves have increased and they have increased thanks to remittance. I mean, the, the, the regime makes 15% of its revenue uh, comes from remittances alone. Um, so that has helped the international reserves. It's a paradox of sorts. Yeah. So, But you, you, you wouldn't, uh, I mean, or would you do what uh, Trump did in Cuba, which is to try to uh, se seriously impede remittance flows? Because that, of course, would hurt the Nicaraguan economy dramatically. I think you have to provide alternatives to, to implement limits to remittances. I mean, what Trump did, I, mean, I think I, I would disagree with a lot of people who say that uh, remittances to Cuba, I mean, they, they did have an effect, but the, the marginal impact, the flow of remittances from the United States to Cuba was, has never been that significant. It's less than $800 million. Um, there is a lot of you saying how much money goes there, but really Cubans, Cubans in the United States have not been able to send significant amounts of money. Obama opened up, but the, the business, the, the remittance companies did not want to go into Cuba because it's too expensive to set up businesses there. So they figured they, they were going to wait. They were going to wait, hopefully, that the opening of Obama will eventually create conditions for a freer economy. But it didn't happen because Trump came in. And the closing, the, the sanctions on FinCEMEX did have an effect on currency, not because of remittances, because of the inability of Cubans to buy stuff. So you may have money in Cuba, but you don't have where to buy things. Okay, but so, so, but, not, but in Nicaragua, in uh, Nicaragua, I think are significant, as you pointed out. I think if you put limits on remittances to Nicaragua, uh, that's not going to make a big difference because it will affect the spending capacity of people. And we're talking about at least 40% of households, depending on remittances, most of them from the United States. So you can do alternatives, but they have to be from the diaspora. Nicaraguans deciding to encourage their relatives to, to spend less money in certain activities, to increase savings, 
and to not do businesses with, you know, where the regime has operations. You can do those sort of things, but you, there isn't much that you can do beyond that. You know, in terms that you emphasized, Manuel, a regional approach, uh, as, as was done in the 1980s with uh, Contadora. Uh, earlier uh, participants, however, pointed out how both Mexico and Brazil, under their current governments, uh, it's difficult to get them to engage in a serious way. Uh, AMLO recently was in Central America. He talks about planting trees. That's very nice, but that falls far short of a diplomatic strategy. Uh, Costa Rica, of course, uh, back in the 80s was a key player. And that Costa Rica, of course, borders Nicaragua. There's a new government in Costa Rica now. Costa Rica has uh, created this tentative or new alliance, Alliance for Development and Democracy, with uh, neighboring Panama and also the Dominican Republic. Uh, do you see a possible role uh, for those three countries uh, in a future diplomatic strategy? I think we need to ask Mexico to be more proactive with regards to Nicaragua and definitely planting trees. Actually, there is a controversy because it increases more deforestation, uh, the type of trees they're proposing. But asking Mexico to, to participate on a dialogue in Nicaragua, at least to release the political prisoners, could be a humanitarian approach and a, a big deal for Mexico to succeed in doing that. And you can even ask Lula to participate on that. But you know, anything that can at least get the political prisoners free will be a positive step forward. And I think Mexico could do it, maybe Brazil, I don't think Costa Rica and the, you know, the, this partnership for democracy can are the, are the right players because you know, they are too close to the United States, but you can have Mexico, Brazil, um, and maybe Honduras participating in this. At the end of the day, bringing them together might actually help calibrate some additional political reforms over time. So here, here's an idea of uh, 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 Ricardo Herrero. Uh, Suppose AMLO were to say, yeah, I've, I've created all this pressure on the summit of the Americas, but here's what, here's what I can do. I can go to Havana and I can go to Managua and I can persuade my friends there to release a significant number of high profile political prisoners. In return for that, they would have to be allowed to attend the Los Angeles summit. What do you think? Would, 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 Managua, <laughs> you think, would Managua and Havana uh, work with AMLO? Um, based on more recent statements by uh, Cuban officials, it seems like they, those, unfortunately, those sentences seem to be a little off limits for the time being. That could be the, the case down the road, but right now, uh, they don't seem to really be budging. Uh, yeah, I AMLO think wasn't it, even it, planning on going. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, it's just much easier for AMLO not to show up. I wouldn't, you know, um it i don't i don't I, there's such little time left between now and the, the summit well, he, invitations I mean, even haven't been mailed um, I know, crazy right no but i'm looking to my point is and, and plus and plus the cubans but i love the, the, cubans, idea. the cubans have <laughs> another thing that was completely yeah. foreseeable was that the cubans were going to capitalize politically across the region over this snuff far more than any advantage to uh biden or to democrats or any or anybody uh, domestically uh, over this administration snubbing Cuba. Um, so I don't think Cuba would give that away um, at yeah, this moment. No, I, I, I see your point. Uh, I think it's about AMLO. I mean, AMLO, uh, yeah. I would think if he were to ask the Cubans, uh, do this I think, as a, I think if this AMLO, AMLO could position himself as a trustworthy uh, mediator between yes. the United States and Cuba to uh, uh, you know, sort of reset relations and in part brokering the release mm. of those uh, political prisoners. I, that is absolutely something that uh, he could do. I just think he needs a little more runway than let's, a couple, let's a couple call it weeks. The Feinberg solution. The Feinberg solution. <laughs> I like okay, it. Hey, look, guys, the, uh, there's nothing like a sharp political deadline to get movement and action, right? So you say, oh, he can't do this. It's, it's three weeks away. We know. No, that's great. It's good. They can't to even get invitations deadline. out. <laughs> like, like, well, so I, I think another issue, by the way, for all three countries, uh, there's a certain puzzle as to why the White House uh, hasn't at least been more adept and efficient 
And uh, I think this part of it, it's always hard to attract attention to the Western hemisphere. That's always the case. Uh, but I do get a sense that there are certain problems in the mechanisms right now of the White House and the National Security Council across the board, uh, not just here in the Western Hemisphere, that seem to be uh, causing problems with, let's say, rational decision making. Uh, so I, it's not all the fault of Juan Gonzalez. <laughs> no, I, I would, I, I mean, from everything that I've gathered, uh, it goes above Juan, it goes above the NSC. It's the political team at the White House. Yeah, they, well, the, they don't have a plan. There's that. They, they, it, they, I feel like there is still this, they're having being forced to deal with these issues, but there's sort of still a prevailing attitude that they would like them to go away. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, it, there is some moralistic perspective on this. Sorry, but go you ahead. Cannot, you cannot also set aside the fact that the Republicans have made everything possible that a US policy to Latin America does not work. Yes, uh, the refusal uh, to, to uh, appoint ambassadors, the refusal even to approve the uh, re US representative to the Organization of American States on the eve of the summit that is partly organized by the OAS. Yeah, uh, the irresponsibility of certain individuals at the Senate really is appalling. Yes, so- uh, it is. At the yeah. same time, we really haven't seen a concerted push by the, by the executive to, for example, get our nominee to the OAS confirmed. Yes. So you have yes, that pushback system. from the Senate, but you're not seeing the administration really- As far as we know, can see, yeah. Put some pressure, so. Chris, are there any comments that anybody would like to make? Uh, to I, I just, to you know, I, I just want to add one point. I, Thank that you. We do need to push uh, a little harder on the issue of misinformation or, you know, like Moises Naim's latest book, Post Truth, we, we have not been able to put a lot of effort on the fact that um, a lot of what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean is that Latin Americans are being given half truths, verdades a medias, by their leaders, and accompanied with clientelism, because clientelism right now is as is, is thriving all over Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the combination make it the perfect formula for the loss of democracy, because there is no deliberation. You're offered some favors, and in exchange, you're telling them, you know, this may, you like it, you might like it. I'm not, I cannot offer you a big solution, but you might like it. And a lot of countries are given that. Look, Honduras just, you know, three days ago, just had now the government, it's, uh, Radio Popular running. I mean, misinformation, it's becoming the tool, the most important tool of ruling next to the use of force. And clientelism is the, the next one. So we have to fight um, these authoritarians with the issue of censorship and misinformation. That's, I, I think that's a great point. Let, let I'd like to add to that if I could. Yes. Go ahead, yeah, Ricardo. I mean, I think that's sort of the flip side of fighting this information is also coming up with a more compelling narrative than what's on the other side, which is what you're seeing lacking here. There's sort of a lack of creativity coming from sort of the more liberal governments in much of the region. Let's, let's use the Biden administration, for example. The Biden administration um, could have reset the narrative towards Cuba could have taken a very strong principal position for why maximum pressure is actually increasing hardship for Cubans on the ground. And it's not, and it's, and if anything, it's shoring up uh, uh, Cuba's authoritarian rulers, why this is a better approach to take, how this is going to empower people and help drive changes on the island. You can make that argument confidently, as we saw during the Obama years. And they've chosen instead to sort of continue a more watered down version of what we saw under Trump, thinking that if they try to out maintain the hard line or out hard line or maintain the policy as it is, that they're going to be somehow rewarded for that by the electorate. And what instead you're seeing is tons of misinformation about Biden and his true intentions, even though they're not doing anything towards Cuba or, or some of these other governments, it's they're, 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 they're shoring up socialism. They are, they're help. They're working. They're in cahoots with the, Diaz Canel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so there needs to be an effort to reset the narrative and come up with a more compelling narrative 
out there to sell right. to the public yeah, because I otherwise you're yeah. lost. Could, I mean, you always hear people say, oh, we have to improve our messaging. Uh, yeah, you need smart PR people, but uh, you need to have a message to deliver. <laughs> Exactly. You need to have an actual narrative to deliver. Uh, otherwise, the misinformation fills the vacuum. So I, I have uh, two, two final questions before we wrap it up. Uh, there's so many fascinating issues on the table. All right. First, in terms of the whole issue of sanctions, uh, we've all talked about how in, in all three cases, uh, we haven't, uh, the sanctions have been from uh, pretty hard to drastic over many years. Uh, they haven't produced the results that, that we would that we would like. Some people say, okay, let's tighten the screws a little further. Maybe that'll produce uh, better results. But how about the acceptance? And I know this is hard to argue uh, for people who are intensely interested in, in the internal politics of these countries, but all right. Uh, the actual net result on the ground of these economic sanctions is the suffering of the very people that we are trying to assist. So why don't we at least uh, revert to the idea of at least let's do no harm here. Uh, if we could get you know, some concessions like release of political prisoners and basically say, uh, we're, go we're going to now remove at least some of these sanctions, uh, which we have not achieved their political goals and are just causing suffering uh, in these countries. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Think of, think of, and then just say, yeah, these are pariah states. They're bad. Uh, we're not going to embrace them by any means. Uh, we'll continue to criticize their bad behavior, et cetera. Uh, but we're no longer going to attempt to uh, manipulate the internal politics. And in fact, we're going to alleviate some of the sanctions. What do you think? I, th I think the, the Carranza doctrine doesn't work. Doesn't mean that um, the, what it is what's happening right now. There is already a, an accommodation. Uh, the US administration doesn't want to acknowledge it, but we have accommodated to living in dictatorships. My, my, I think my approach is that you, it's not one or the other. You have to do both approaches. Put economic pressure, put economic diplomacy, make political pressure, but also promote mediation and try to come up with a, with a change in the balance of power of that relationship. That hasn't been tried. So it's not that you can only use sanctions. Sanctions do not have a direct effect. They have a different purpose. And you know, combine the different strategies and put your effort into it. We haven't made that effort to increase the risk propensity to focus on leadership and promoting democracy. You know, we have been numbed about it. So, you know, if you want fresh approaches, let's talk about democracy 2.0 in the 21st century. We haven't done that. We're still talking about elections. People don't want to know about elections. They want to know how do you deliver what I want right now to a mobile app, by the way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francisco, any comments? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I think, it, it, you know, there are sort of two issues that are conflated, but sometimes, uh, uh, but, but can, should not be analyzed separately. One is the humanitarian sort of aspects. And, you know, th there are plenty of things in the middle between just lifting sanctions and, and you know, and leaving sanctions as they, as they are, uh, that can be done in, the, in that space. Uh, because, for example, in, in the case of Venezuela, you can see that the status quo, uh, it's worse than, you know, plenty other alternatives from both perspectives, in the sense that, you know, the way the money is flowing to Venezuela today is such a, a, a crazy, you know, you basically are, are, are destroying value because Venezuela is, is selling oil at a very heavily discounted, a lot of intermediaries and corrupt individuals in the middle. The money used to go to Russia and came back in cash, in planes, about half of it. Imagine uh, uh, the, the degree to which the, 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 all the, even the, 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 the checks and the accountability that the Chavistas, that, which was very limited, that they have, it, it's totally, uh, uh, you know, disappeared because, because there, there are no, there is no budget, there is no, uh, the National Oil Company of Venezuela basically sells the oil to companies that are created two weeks before and then disappear. Uh, so, you know, th there is simply no, uh, uh, you know, no, no uh, minimal accountability. If you can do something that is uh, an alternative, um, that is, you know, uh, generating opportunities to fund uh, international, for example, cooperation programs and the like, 
that will be, I think, very positive. Of course, that has to be somehow um, accommodated with the other uh, objectives, which are you know, political uh, change in some specific areas. And uh, uh, now, in the case of Venezuela, different from the others, the issue of oil production uh, for, the, for the world market. No? Um, but uh, and the, other, the other thing I, I wanted to mention about the connection between these three, these three countries, you know, I, I think for Cuba, uh, the increase in the price of oil today is very, very problematic. Um, and it has been in the past, you know, the electricity in Cuba runs out in diesel. Gasoline is, is very minimal, but diesel is very important. And, and, and Cuba uh, produces a little bit of oil, but needs a, a lot of imported oil. And Venezuela is supplying, but not, not, not everything, right? And so I, I, I do think that the, in some way, the, 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 the issues between these three countries are, are, are connected. And, and so my expectation when the Obama administration uh, uh, policies towards Cuba were changing is that Cuba would be instrumental in, in the Venezuelan story. Unfortunately, of course, that, that policy was, was reversed and, and, and we, we don't know if that, if that would have worked out. But it seems to me that you need to get a way to the, for the Cubans to uh, uh, solve either their, their energy issues or their you know, broader economic interest uh, if you want them to help in the in the Venezuelan uh, situation, so so that that uh, 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 that, that makes them uh, connected. And and one thing that I, that I really you know when everybody told me about you know the negotiation between Maduro and the U.S. this grand bargain in which uh, Maduro abandons the Russians and the Chinese, you know, like uh, Saddam Hussein abandoned uh, uh, the, uh, the Russians at some point. I think one of the big problems there is that he will rely on the Cubans for advice. And, and what they will tell him is, you know, what you said, you know, this is, these people are not uh, to be trusted. And, 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 you know, and this is not a bargain that will work out because there will always be a constituency in the US that will try to, to push for something uh, very different. So uh, Rick, did you wanna take a quick yeah, I, just, I, I just wanna add that, um, you know, I, I think in this administration, you saw a recognition early on that our sanctions programs uh, needed to be reviewed and that we needed to be more strategic about sanctions, uh, more you know, and more surgical in our in approach to uh, who we impose sanctions on, uh, and reducing collateral damage on innocent people, uh, impacting the flow of humanitarian aid, and so on and so forth. Um, there wasn't a recognition. They ordered a review. You saw Treasury come up with a series of of findings back in October, that, uh, stating that from here on out we're going to be more strategic and how we implement sanctions. We're going to try to reduce collateral damage. I think in the, in the sanctions that you've seen the administration take towards Cuba in response to uh, the crackdown on the protests, it's, in, it's sort of animated by that to a degree because they've been targeted. They're almost, they're toothless, largely. They're sanctioning people that were already sanctioned to the gills, but there haven't been broad sanctions. They haven't been blanket. They're not sanctions that impact innocent lives on the ground. The problem is what is defining your sanctions approach? Is there an actual strategy? Are you trying to advance national interests abroad? Are you trying to achieve an outcome in another country? Or is it being fueled by domestic politics? So often how we approach sanctions is, I need something that makes me look tough, that makes us look like we're doing right, something. Right, right. So we, we enforce sanctions in a very sort of like brain dead kind of way. Yeah. And then Imposing those sanctions is good because I look hard, but if I lift them, even if they're entirely counterproductive, I look soft. I know. So Just we're very good at imposing sanctions, but yeah. we're terrible at lifting them, even though, it, even if it would right. achieve our and, strategic. And interest. this, by the way, is a worldwide problem. When the administration first came in, uh, the NSC said they were going to completely review all the many, 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 many sanctions that, that have been imposed on a worldwide basis. Exactly. What happened to that review? No, so that's the review. They came up with findings that were very general, and we haven't seen them really head in that direction. Yeah, I, not, not just on Cuba. I'm saying this. No, was not a, just on Cuba in general. Sure, in general. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was referring. Well, they, yeah. they have right. added sanctions now to Russia significantly, yes. so that they actually, dramatically, it, dramatically. As, as Ricardo said, what what tends to happen is that sanctions once they are set in are very very difficult uh, uh, right. to remove. So they that's, they, that's they one, take a life of their own. That's one of the lessons that we've seen. Uh, you guys were fantastic. A lot of interesting, fresh ideas. Uh, I gave you a tough assignment and you all come off with shining A pluses. So thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.